to introduce the very busy Dr. Mark Wallace. He is a professor of clinical anesthesiology, the chair of Division of Pain Medicine in the Department of Anesthesiology, UCSD School of Medicine. He is currently in his sixth year on the board of directors for the American Pain Society and has served on numerous committees for national and international pain societies. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Wallace. Thank you for Thank being you. here. Thank you. So can, I, can everybody hear me? Is this on? Yep, okay. So um, a little bit of, of my background, I am an anesthesiologist. I, I uh, did an extra training in pain medicine back in 1992. Um, I don't do anesthesiology anymore. The last time I administered an anesthetic was in 2001. Um, and then I, I, then I went full-time pain. Um, we have a very, probably one of the, the largest pain programs in Southern California with uh, 15 faculty that just devote their time to pain management. We have psychologists. We collaborate with integrative medicine, physiatrists, neurologists. Uh, it, it, it's a very multidisciplinary program. Um, and then I got in, I was in California in 1996 when uh, med medical cannabis was legalized. And at that time, I was in favor of it, but on the fence of, well, gosh, we don't even know how to use it. What dose to use? What type to use? And, and, and so moving fast forward today, we've learned a lot about it. Um, just the, the history of, of cannabis is very interesting because it dates back to thousands of years. It's been in societies, integrated into multiple societies for, for many, many, many years. In China, first century, there were reports of its use in pain, um, rheumatic pain. In India, it was reported to be used as a sedative, as an anti-anxiety, uh, a, a seizure medicine, and, and pain relieving. And then in the, the early 1800s, it was a Dr. William Oshaganesi, who we consider the father of, of medical cannabis. And he actually wrote a book on, on the use of cannabis for, for various ailments. And it was added to the U.S. dispensatory in 1845 in place of opium. They thought that it was a better alternative than opium. And then in the late 19th, early 20th century, there were even more reports coming out of its use in treatment of migraine headache, uh, 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 pain related to nervous system injury. Um, multiple uh, patent medicines came, arose, and then came, then came along the reefer madness and the demonizing of, of cannabis. And that was the attorney general at the time that lost his battle against prohibition for alcohol and turned all of the efforts into demonizing cannabis. And it was re that resulted in it being removed from the pharmacopoeia in 1942 against the advice of the American Medical Association. They felt that it had a role and a place and it was widely used uh, for, to treat uh, uh, in, in medicine. And then it was pretty much from 1942 to decades, it was just was so demonized and nobody was really focusing on any type of very little research. And then in 1996, it was California Prop 215 was passed. At the same time, Arizona's proposition was passed and Arizona's was in, um, invalidated. Uh, but then, then, then it came back a few years later that they got it legalized. So California has been the first to legalize a cannabis. So we're way ahead of the rest of the country and what we've learned. So this is where, in 1996, I didn't jump on the bandwagon. I didn't say, okay, we're gonna start using it. I didn't use it at all. I was a little bit skeptical and well, how, we don't, what's the safety, what dosing? Um, and then I'll show you how, how it evolved after that. But the, 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 can't, the number of states that are legalizing cannabis is growing. And um, it's, uh, there's 29 states plus the District of Columbia for medical use recreational and medical use, nine states plus District of Columbia, and then you have CBD only, which CBD is the non-psychoactive part. 17 states only have the CBD uh, legalized. Now, I'll talk a little bit about CBD. I think there's an abnormal hype surrounding CBD. Um, I don't think there's m much of a role in CBD alone in the treatment of pain. It doesn't work very well because, and I'll tell you why in just a bit, it's basically related to dosing. The, the, the milligram dose that would be required to really have a good effect of CBD would be cost prohibitive. It'd be thousands and thousands of dollars a month in cost. Um, there's a drug called Epidiolex, which is a, a CBD oil extract that's FDA approved to treat Dravet syndrome in children. 
Children, they have intractable seizures. These are infants. These are six-month-old infants that they give like 500, 600, 800 milligrams per dose into these kids to stop their, their, their seizures. Well, in comparison, what we're using kind of in the dispensaries is maybe 20 milligrams. It, it, and, and that Epidiolex costs $16,000 a year to maintain that CBD in that, in that population. Now, medical cannabis is different from cannabinoid pharmaceuticals. And I, and, and, and I get this all the time and say, well, why do we need medical cannabis? Why can't we just make something in the lab? And we have synthetic THC. We have dronabinol. We have nabilone. These are synthetics that I have not had much success with. I've tried to use them clinically. And either the patients say they get too, it comes on too much and they don't like the effects or it's a side effects and, and the absorption is so erratic when they, they, they ingest it. And then you have the, um, the actual um, uh, medical cannabis uh, products. Those are the, in the leaf here. And you have varying levels of THC and CBD and, and the terpenes, which are, have some effect. Um, and then you have extracts. Like this Sativex is actually an extract. It's it, the CBD oil and the THC oil is extract and put into a sublingual spray and you spray it under the tongue. Um, and, and I think those are, there, there's a role for these, but they're different. I just want to make the point, the pharmaceuticals, the synthetics are different from the, from the medical cannabis. And something else I want to point out is that these THC in the leaf and CBD in the leaf are very weak agonists. They, they don't stimulate our cannabinoid receptors very, very strongly, and, and they don't bind to them very strongly. And that's a good thing, because if you stimulate the, our cannabinoid system too much, you have really serious negative effects. But the, do, the amount, they're so weak that you could not get enough. You would not be able to ingest enough to cause any death. Uh, uh, there's, and then there's, ne there's never been a reported death from uh, medical marijuana or any marijuana products, as opposed to our opiates, well, where there's a major crisis. And now the, the cannabinoids work on two receptors. The, the cannabinoid receptors, there's CBD1 and CB2, they're the most abundant receptor in our body. They're found all over the place. They're found in the brain, in the spinal cord, in the peripheral nerve. They're found in the liver. They're found on immune cells. And they're there for a purpose. And I'll show you here in just a minute. But the CB1 receptors are located all over the brain and the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, whereas the CB2 receptors are located on inflammatory cells. So that makes, that's why cannabis is, is, is known to reduce inflammation. And um, an example is this, how, uh, the, the importance of that is because you have tobacco use, right? Tobacco and inhalation of tobacco uh, increases the risk of lung cancer. Um, however, habitual cannabis users don't seem to have an increased risk of cancer, of, in, of lung cancer. And it's probably because of the, the anti-inflammatory effect that when they inhale it, it's actually suppressing the inflammation in the lung. Whereas tobacco users, it's pro-inflammatory. All that uh, tobacco just, just, just the, the uh, inflammatory cells just infiltrate the lungs and then they start getting increased risk of cancer. Um, now the cannabinoid refers to a variety of compounds. There's our endocannabinoids, which is a, a system in our body that is there for a purpose that I'll, I'll describe in just a minute. There's the phytocannabinoids, which are derived from the cannabis plant, and then there's synthetic. Um, the problem, again, coming back to the synthetic, is I think some of those synthetics are too potent. And I don't know if you've heard the reports of these spices and these kids taking spices that are they're, they're really, really potent THC products, and you don't want to use really, really potent THC products. So this is our endocannabinoid system, and it's there for a purpose. It's a very important system. It's there that, that, to stimulate our appetite. It's there to help us sleep. It helps us relax. Um, it, it, it's there for our memory. So it, it, it's, uh, and then, so overall, it's there to protect us. And so it's, it's something that is, the, this is the endocannabinoid. There's two endocannabinoids, very important. It's called anandamide and 2-AG. And the important point I want to make is these are made on demand. 
They, they're made when you get stressed, when you get hungry, when you um, uh, get, get uh, if you have pain, if you injure yourself, it induces the release of these, these cannabinoids. So it's there to provide a feedback to, to, to bring things back to normal. And there have been a lot of, of, of research looking at syndromes that may be due to the overactivity of our endocannabinoid system or the underactivity. And an example is severe, um, whoops, severe anxiety, maybe, is, a, is, is you don't have enough. Or maybe severe depression, you don't have enough. Um, there's also uh, fibromyalgia. There's a, 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 a theory that maybe this is a, 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 the endocannabinoid system is underactive. Now, if you look at medical cannabis and the evidence for pain, this is where it's really controversial. And you'll hear a lot of different uh, say, oh, it doesn't work. Um, the problem is we don't have a lot of good evidence because it's so hard to study. And the reason it's so hard to study is because it's scheduled one, meaning the government views cannabis as having no medicinal purposes. So, and so we have to go through a lot of regulatory hurdles to do research with cannabis. And we are limited to the cannabis provided by the government, which is NIH. And that cannabis does not represent the real world cannabis that our patients are getting in the dispensaries. So now there is pre-modern use of pain, which I went in the first slide. There's also experimental pain. And this is what I've, an, an area of research that dates back to 25 years where I developed human experimental pain models to take healthy volunteers, give them medications, and then induce pain. And the pain that I induced was capsaicin. You take capsaicin and you inject it in the forearm. And it's like a really strong bee sting. Um, and when I got my first grant for cannabis, I, I, it was a crossover design, which was placebo, low dose, medium dose, and high dose. And this was inhaled. And what I found was that the low dose was no different than the pl placebo. The high dose actually worsened the pain, and the medium dose reduced the pain. And this is what we're seeing, and this is that brings, and I'll go over a little bit of this later as how it's really important to dose this stuff, because if you take too much, you'll have negative effects, and you'll actually report worsening of your pain and worsening of your, your, your anxiety. And, and then we have more modern studies, which they're limited and small, and they're limited and small because you, I can't do multi-center trials with this medical cannabis. We can't do studies across state lines. We're limited to all of the research we got, money we got in California, we were limited to stay within California. The best evidence seems to be with ner pain after nervous system injury. Um, another problem with these studies is it's a very wide vari vari variation in study product and what they're used. Um, this is an, a, 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 an example of a kind of a meta-analysis of, of, of studies and they, looked at all the literature in there, and they had identified 15 of 18 trials that met their inclusion criteria. They were trying to have a pretty high standard as far as placebo controlled and, and blinded and, and randomized. And they found that 15 uh, showed significant analgesic effect, that there seems to be evidence leaning towards this does work in, in the relief of pain. Now this is the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research at UC, uh, at the UC San Diego. And this was started with in, in uh, 1999, funded off of uh, uh, the, the state of California, $25 million grant at the time, Gray Davis. And that went to research, to develop research. And this has started the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research, which was a, a collaboration between UC San Diego, UC San Francisco, UC Davis, um, and these were the studies that came out of this center. Um, understanding that they're single site, they're small, but every one of them showed a positive effect. Um, it's cutting off, for some reason it's cutting off some of my slide here, but you'll see over here all of it is positive as far as the um, uh, effects of, of, of the cannabis on relieving pain from a number of different neuropathic pain, such as neuro, uh, um, HIV neuropathy, uh, actually, it also showed a relief of uh, multiple sclerosis, spasticity, and pain. And then my most recent study was with diabetic neuropathy. Um, now, coming back to CBD, there's, there's uh, this hype around CBD. And I think the hype around some of the preclinical studies in CBD, looking at rat models, and you can 
give, uh, induce pain in a rat, and you can give them drugs. And it did show with um, a pretty significant reduction in their pain. But remember, these doses were so much higher than what we're, we're using in, in, in the, the dispensaries. Because when we started looking at it in, in uh, the uh, cl uh, humans, the clinical evidence for cannabinoid efficacy in neuropathic pain is very poor for CBD alone. Now, when you, and, and it seems to have a much a less analgesic effect than observed with THC on a milligram per milligram basis. But what you're finding is that when you combine the two, it works quite well. And, and the CBD seems to reduce the psychoactive effect of the TAC. And there is some interaction between the two on the receptor system. And, and so I always, almost always, do combination therapy with CBD and THC. Now, what about the role of cannabis in reducing this opioid crisis? We're uh, at a, 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 a major crisis with up to um, over 19,000 deaths annually from prescription opioids alone. And if you look at the recreational, it's over 60,000 deaths annually. And this is what got me interested in cannabis. Because I started in, in pain medicine in the early 90s where we were taught, you know, just give them opioids. The opioids are safe and there's no upper limit. And, and boy, did we make a mistake. And probably around two, in the mid-2000s, I started really questioning uh, probably maybe the late 90s, early 2000s, I started questioning whether this was the right thing. And then as I got to, to um, interested in cannabis, over time I thought, well, maybe I could use cannabis to, to get these patients off of the opioids because an opioid is a drug that once you start taking it and you get on it chronically, it will not want to let you go. And these patients would try to get off of these opioids and they, they say, my pain is so bad, Dr. Wallace. And, and I can't do it, and, and it just, it's, 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 there's not a fine line between, between treating pain and addiction. I think that we turned a lot of our pain patients into, into addicts. Now, having said that, I still have some patients that do well on opioids. They're, they're in the minority, but they, if I didn't give them that opioid, they, they would ha not have a life. Um, so there is this, this, this was a survey, and, and looking at, uh, how, are asking them, have you ever used cannabis as a substitute prescription? And what we're finding is most of them are replacing opioids. And these were just surveys. This is not in our clinic. This is just out there. And, and we're finding that patients, independent of their, the health care system, they're going to the dispensaries and they're replacing opioids and benzodiazepines and antidepressants with, with cannabis. Um, females were six times more likely, Med uh, medical users 4.6 times, 4 times more likely, uh, pain, anxiety, and depression. So most of them are, are, are females. Now, what about the abuse potential? And, and this is, uh, cannabis is the number one abuse drug in our society. Now, it, and, and it's, it, it's the number one drug because it depends on how you define abuse. And it's illegal. Right? Anything you're taking illegal is automatically abuse. And so that's why they say it's uh, the highest abuse. It, I don't think it's really abused. It doesn't seem to have that um, ro as ro a robust of a, of a dependency as heroin and cocaine and nicotine. Nicotine is probably much more, has a much more dependence on, than, than the, the cannabis. Now, it also depends on how you define abuse, because I'm gonna, this is important because I'm going to talk some of these studies, that, these epidemiological studies that say, no, cannabis is worse, it's causing more abuse. And then others say, oh, no, it's reducing uh, opioid use. So if this, these are the same patient population, and if you look at three different methods of defining abuse, this one, whoops, this one um, here, is the a psychiatry definition, and then these are more definitions that are a little bit uh, less uh, strict. And if you, if you look at this one right here, none of the patients were defined as abu abuse, abusing cannabis. Um, whereas this one, almost 20, 25% were saying that they were abusing cannabis. What about, now, one of the problems with opioids is that you start taking them and the body starts becoming immune to, this, to the, to the uh, effects, and you have to take more and more and more and more. Um, this is typical of, 
of the uh, uh, opioid abusers, like the heroin, and they start taking it for recreational purposes, and they like that feeling, they like that high, and then they start losing that effect, and then they take more, and then more, and then more, and then pretty soon they say, this is not doing anything for me, and then they try to go off of it, and it's horrible withdrawal. So we don't seem to see that with cannabis. You do see this, I do see tolerance to some of the non-psychological effects, like you can have a slight increase in heart rate when you start taking it. Um, and you actually have a little bit of a tolerance to the high effect, highness effect. The first, you, they start, they, that little bit of euphoria and patients tend to say, well, that goes away. Um, but, the, but they still have the pain relief. And then there's also this de de dependence and withdrawal. Now, if you take, use cannabis, now, it's back to a, a, an opioid. If I start a patient, I have a patient that's a chronic opioid user. If they stop that opioid, they will report first bone searing pain. They will report feeling horrible, like flu-like symptoms. Um, now cannabis has a, a similar withdrawal syndrome. If you're taking it habitually, if you're taking it around the clock, and you're gonna, I mean, you're smoking it five, six, seven times a day, and you're doing that for months on end, yeah, when you stop it, you're gonna have a withdrawal. From it, just like um, very similar to the opioids. I don't see this uh, with, with my medical use though, because the medical use you'll, you'll, I'll tell you, show you in just a minute, the, the doses we're using are so small with THC that I never see it. If I t and I take an opioid user, their life revolves around the opioid. They will look at the clock. When do I get my next dose? They will look at their supply and when the supply starts going down, they start getting anxious because they need to make, they, they've experienced that withdrawal. If I can get them off of the opioid and on to medical cannabis, that behavior goes completely away. They come back to me and they say they have their life back. Their life is not revolving around the cannabis. They're not looking at the next time they're going to get their dose of cannabis. They run out of the cannabis. And I say, well, what do you do? And they say, well, my pain goes up a little bit, but I've got to wait until I get to the dispensary and, 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 and get the uh, refill. Um, now, let's look at some of the effects of the medical cannabis laws on, on the opioid, uh, our, our opioid use in our society. And, and we'll look at the good and the bad. Um, and the good is there are population studies that are emerging suggesting that medical marijuana patients are substituting marijuana for opioids. There's several dating back to 2009, the most recent in 2017. This was a study that was published in the, Ameri the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2010. And they looked at the relationship of medical cannabis laws on opioid analgesic overdose. Uh, and they looked at several variables, medical cannabis laws, prescri prescription drug monitoring program. And what they, sh they showed is that the only thing that had a positive correlation with reduction in opioid overdoses was medical cannabis laws. All these other prescription drug monitoring program and, 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 and law re allowing pharmacists to request patient identification didn't have any effects. Um, this was a study looking at hospital discharges over about a, 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 a almost a 10 year period. And they showed medical marijuana policies were associated with no change in marijuana dependence or abuse discharges, but a 23% reduction in opioid dependence or abuse, and a 13% reduction in opioid pain reliever o overdose. Um, and then this one was looking at um, cannabis laws patterns for opioid and Medicare Part D. Medicare Part D is a very, very large database that they can track it. And they looked at over an average of 23 million daily doses dispensed per year across states. And they showed that it actually resulted in medical cannabis laws that allowed active dispensaries a 3.7 million reduction. Those that allowed home cultivation, 1.79 million reduction. Now the largest effect was seen with hydrocodone and there's a reason with that was because the, these studies were done in a time when hydrocodone was schedule three and so it was much, much more widely used. You, you, you don't see much of an effect on the schedule two drugs because they're just such more highly regulated. Um, and then this is a, a study looking at cannabis use associated with decreased opioid use. And they showed that there was a 64% reduction in opioid use, decreased side effects, and improved quality of life in these patients that, that switched to the cannabis. And then this one was looking at um, 
uh, recreational marijuana legalization and prescription opioid in Medicare. So that you have to differentiate between medical laws and recreational. Um, they did show a, a reduction in hydrocodone use, but not with the Schedule II drugs. But again, that, that, that's because hydrocodone was Schedule III at the time of these studies, which is much, much more widely used. Now, what about the bad? And there's, there's, all, there's been studies out there that, that have counteracted this. And uh, so the, this was uh, one that showed cannabis use and risk of prescription opioid use disorder. And they looked at two time periods, 2000 to 2002, and then from 2004 to 2005. And they used this DSMV4. Remember, that's the one that has a very strict definition and they're gonna, they, they're, there's more people they say are, 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 are abusing it than if you use some of these other uh, methods. And they said that cannabis use increased non-medical prescription opioid use and opioid use disorder. Um, adults with pain and cannabis use increase in non-medical opioid use. So again, this is, you have to be careful with, with this. I look at this and say, well, I don't, I mean, the DSMV4 is good for the heroin addict but it's not so good for patients that are, that are using opiates to treat their pain. It, um, and then this one was a study that was published in Australia that got a lot of press because it was um, a study that looked at four-year prospective national observation cohort study in chronic pain patients on opioids. And they took all comers. It was uh, over 1,500 patients. And they said that 24% of these 1,500 reported that they were using cannabis. And they said, compared to no cannabis, there was worsening of their pain, worsening of pain interference, worsening of their generalized anxiety disorder. And they said there's no evidence that cannabis reduced pre prescribed opioid use or increased rates of opioid discontinuation. Now, the problem with this is that you have to divide out those that are using high doses of THC and low doses of THC. If I just let patients because I ask, when patients come to me, we ask every one of them if they've, had, if they've tried cannabis, or medical cannabis, because it's so common. And it's very common response to say, oh, yeah, I tried it, and I hated it. It was horrible. They, it made my pain worse and made me agitated. And, and then I said, well, you, did, did you ever get any medical advice? And they say, no, they just go to the dispensary. And the dispensary hand them these high doses of THC. If I can get them to start over, and we use very low doses of THC, most of them will come back and say, wow, it does work, and I don't feel impaired. Um, so this is an example of these patients who were probably just overdosed with, with, with uh, cannabis, and so I know, it makes sense that they're going to report worsening of their pain. Now, and this is interesting concept because there's this biphasic effect of, 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 of THC and CBD. And this is a study, this is a, a rat study. It's, you can, you, it's called a place preference model, and you can put a rat in a center chamber here, and you can have one chamber that they associated with good and, a, and a, another chamber that they associate with bad. And what they showed is that high doses of THC produced condition place aversion. They would avoid that, that chamber that, that had food laced with high doses of THC. However, the side that had low doses of THC, they preferred, and the rats will migrate to the chamber they learn the difference, and they know, okay, this chamber has, has, uh, has low-dose THC, and this chamber has high-dose THC. I don't want to avoid it. So human cannabis uh, uh, smokers have also reported this, and we have reported it in our clinical research. Remember my human experimental pain study? I said low doses not effective, high doses worsening of their pain, medium doses reduce their pain. This was a stu our study in diabetic peripheral neuropathy patients. And, and I, I used the placebo-controlled, low-dose, medium-dose, high-dose, and all these patients crossed over at uh, weekly intervals between the two the different doses. And what I showed was a dose-dependent reduction in their pain. They said, my, my, my neuropathy in my feet is reducing. But I noticed that the high-dose, it started kind of turning up. And, and something you got to understand, these were all inhalation. They were vaporized. And the blood levels are all over the place. They, some of the high... Uh, doses had blood levels that were lower than the low dose. And so what we do is we pulled all of the blood levels and we correlated it with their pain reduction. So this is the pain and this is a, a, a plasma level of about two 
um, nanograms per ml, which is not much pain relief. But as I started going up in the, in the blood level, their pain reduced. But then I reached the point where it started going in the opposite direction. So there's the therapeutic window. If you take too much, if you don't take enough, you're not going to have pain. If you take too much, you're going to worsen their pain. Um, and then what about cannabis and sleep? There's, uh, there's many of my patients that, that I uh, uh, will do try to dose them, and they'll come back, and I said, how are you doing? And some of them say, well, it's not helping my pain. But boy, am I sleeping well. And, and a lot of them will elect to stay on it for sleep. The problem is we don't have a lot of good evidence for sleep. It's, and, the, and there's also been conflicting studies that have showed, some studies say, oh, THC, it worsens their sleep. And then others say, oh, yeah, it does help their sleep. But that's the, the difference between taking too much and not taking enough. If you take too much, it will worsen your sleep. You'll become agitated and get paranoia, and, 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 and you won't sleep as well. Um, there is this biphasic effect but with CBD, too, because low doses of CBD are, are stimulating, and they actually can keep you awake, whereas higher doses are sedating. But the, if, you wanna, if you look at the dosing range of THC, starting the pain-relieving doses and the sleep doses, the pain-relieving doses are around 1 to 2 milligrams a dose. The sleep doses are around three or four milligrams. You bump it up a little bit. However, if you start getting into the about 10 milligrams, you start getting paranoia. If you start getting into 20 milligrams, you get psychosis. Now, compare that. So that was a range of one to 20 milligrams. CBD, the range goes from 10 milligrams to 800 milligrams. So 10 milligrams are probably not much pain relieving. It's going to take probably a three or four hundred milligrams before you start getting into some of the sedating and maybe even some pain relieving effects. And then it's to be 800 milligrams to get into that anti-seizure effect. So that's why CBD is the hype. Is, 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 it's just not a, a very, very helpful at these lower doses unless you combine it with CBD or with THC. And this is a, another thing that's really interesting. There's um, this issue with sleep apnea. I don't know if anybody has sleep apnea has to use CPAP. And it's a device that most patients don't like wearing. It's uncomfortable. And, uh, um, but this was a study that looked and showed that uh, the, the cannabinoids actually improved sleep apnea. It reduced the apneic episodes. And I've had two patients come back to me, and they volunteer. They say, you know, Dr. Wallace, I started on with cannabis, and I'm, I, I did away with my CPAP. I don't need my CPAP anymore. So we have a, um, there is something about it that, that, that's, probably working on the brainstem. They're stimulating those cannabinoid receptors in the brainstem that's improving the, the, the sleep apnea. And we have a, a pulmonologist, a, a sleep specialist at UC San Diego that's trying to get some funding to look at this. Now, what about patient selection? Um, should they be as strict as opioids? And now, if we select patients for opioids, first of all, we want them to fail conservative therapies. We do a risk assessment. Uh, we do psychological assessment. Uh, we're pretty strict before we're going to put somebody on an opioid. And, and also, somebody that's on an opioid, we do urine drug testing. And we, wanna, we do that periodically to make sure they, we see the, the opioid in their urine. We make sure there are not any illicit drugs in, the, in their urine. Um, the, should we do it with cannabis? Because the, the, you know, the abuse potential of cannabis is pretty low. I do urine drug testing with my cannabis users for the reason I tell them, first of all, I want to make sure that you don't have any other drugs in there, other illicit drugs. I want to make sure you don't have an opioid in your, your system. If they have an opioid in your system, I say, well, why is you having an opioid? You have to choose. I want to make them choose between cannabis or an opioid. I also want to show that, that they have the THC in their urine, and then I can observe them, and I can document that they're, they don't look intoxicated, their oh, speech is normal, they ambulate normal, and I th that's an added level of protect protecting them. Um, we have patient agreements that we have them sign uh, uh, that they will keep the cannabis safe, they'll keep it away from children. Um, and then, now the issue of concurrent opioid use, I've talked to you about that. I, when I first got into this, I was really a hard ass. I said, you gotta be off the opioid. I'm not gonna let you use the cannabis in, unless you're off the opioid. And I had a lot of patients that were very motivated, and they wanted to get off their opioid. But they would, I would put them on a weaning schedule, a very slow weaning schedule. 
And I found that about 5% of the patients, I'd put them on a weaning schedule and they go completely off of the opioid. And they say, wow, I feel better. I don't even need the cannabis. And then there were about 5% that I would do that first dose reduction and they spin out of control. And I say, okay, stop. We need to get you into our addictionologist. We may have another problem. But the majority of them would go through varying levels of, of taper, but they would, and, and they were compliant and they were hanging in there. And they were just saying, God, my pain is just up and I'm withdrawing and say, well, let me introduce the cannabis. And what I found is when I started to introduce the cannabis, they would chill out. And then they would continue their wean off of their opioid. Um, so now what I do is I, I see them and make sure they're appropriate for the, the medical cannabis. And then I have a, the, it, I tell them it's a complicated therapy. There's so many different types. There's so many different modes of delivery. There's so many different ratios of CBD to THC. I know how to dose it, but I don't have time to sift them. So I have a doctor of naturopathic medicine that's affiliated with our, our program. And I send them to her for the dosing consultation. And she sits down with them and goes over what their goals are, sleep, pain, and gives them guidance on, on the product to use, the ratio of CBD to THC, the method of delivery, and then they follow up with me. She's also there for, for, for my quality control because the, the quality control is getting a lot better in California because in, in, in um, January of 2018, the um, Bureau of Cannabis Control kicked in. And so now all products that are hitting the shelves in the dispensaries have to have certificates of analysis. And so we, we know what's in there, we know the content, we know that they're free of pesticides, insecticides, free of fungal uh, water content. And so Dr. Sexton helps me with that. She will actually sometimes even go and look at the certificates of analysis in the, in the dispensaries and so she can review it. Um, so it's getting better. So the way we do it here at UC San Diego is we want, I want them to fail conservative therapies first. I have a lot of patients that come to me and say, I want medical cannabis. And they haven't even tried some really simple things. So I'm not, it's not a cure-all. And I try to get them to understand, let's try some more conventional things. However, I do think it should be done before o opioids. I, I think it's a much safer and more effective treatment than opioids. I provide them authorization through the Department of Public Health. And then they have the option of going through the Department of Public Health to get their card. I send them for the dosing consultation. Um, if they're on chronic opioids, I say, I give them a weaning schedule. And I say, don't start the weaning schedule until you've had the dosing consultation and you have the cannabis available. And then I, then I say, go as far as you can go before you introduce the cannabis. Um, and then I follow up with them. And I document in the medical record what type they're using, what the response is. Um, and, and I can tweak it sometimes there and, uh, without having to send them back to Dr. Sexton because at least I have it. They're started and I can say, well, let's change some ratios. And then, of course, I, 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 I will consider doing urine drug testing. So I'm going to stop there. I didn't want to, there's so much I can talk about, but I want to find, leave uh, time for, for question and answers. So are there any, any questions? No. Could you talk briefly about the ratio of the THC to the, yeah. just generally? To the, yeah. So, so the, the most common, we, we, we tend to use a high CBD to THC ratio during the day. And usually the starting point is between maybe 20 to 30 to one ratio. So, and, and then, the, 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 um, so let, me, let me talk a little bit about the modes of delivery. And uh, start with, start with uh, uh, inhalation first. Inhalation, um, we don't like the patients to smoke it. We don't like them to flash it into smoke. I don't think that's healthy. I think that there's, it's just not healthy for the lung. We don't want them, have you heard all the, the issue of the uh, uh, vaping and the lung injury? We t have, I've been telling my patients for years, I don't want you to vape the extracts. Because those oil extracts, we don't know what's in there. We don't know the extraction process. We don't know the safety. So we tell them, we want you to vaporize organically grown flour. And the vape, when I did my diabetic neuropathy studies, I had to use this big volcano system. And we flashed it into a vapor into a big cellophane bag, and they have to inhale it from the cellophane bag. 
Now these vaporizers have gotten down to the size of, of this. And you have chambers that you can open it up, put the leaf in there, close it, and then and they, the costs range from $50 to $500. And, uh, and the difference is that if you want to control the temperature, you're going to be paying more. And so what we, we actually prefer them to go for one that has a temperature control because then they can put the leaf in there and start with the lowest temperature, which is like 170 degrees, and then inhale it. Because the higher the temperature goes up, the more of the uh, THC and the CBD and the terpenes that are going to be released. So the, the advantages of the inhalation is it's very fast onset. It, it's going to be predictable. It's going to be in your system, but it's not going to last very long. Um, the uh, other, probably the most popular mode of delivery is the oils under the tongue, the tinctures. It's, and, and, but the thing is that that's, you, know, you put them under your tongue and you salivate. It stays there for maybe a minute or two, and then you swallow it. So most of the effect you're getting from it is from ingestion. The problem with the ingestion is that the absorption is very erratic. It can be very delayed. And this is why for edibles or for any type of going through, through the mouth and swallowing it, we tell them to start off very, very low. Mm -hmm. So you take a, a dropper full, and you start off with a ratio of maybe 20 to 1, and take like maybe 0.2 mLs of the, of the dropper. Drop it under your tongue as a start. Mm -hmm. And then you have to titrate from there. You have to say, if that's not enough, then the next dose maybe go a little bit more. Um, and then at night, we go to a 1 to 1 ratio because we want to bump up the, the, the THC. So the dose that they're getting, you're getting from the 20 to 1 and that little bit of a 0.2 mL, you're probably only getting about 1 milligram of THC. And you're getting probably 10 to 20 milligrams of, of CBD. If you go up to a half, you're going to probably get up more three or four. When you go to a one to one ratio, and you start that 0.2 mLs or so, you're getting about four or five milligrams of THC. Yeah? I've done about me two CBD oils um, that I started on a very low dose of the, the dropper. And um, it gives them, I, I have heart palpitations. It's, and you what? I have heart palpitations. Heart, heart palpitations? So, so, so I'm wondering what the dose is. Because I'm wondering what the dose is. Now, under, now THC, what happens with, with THC, if it's the heart, is that it increases your heart rate and it drops your blood pressure. Now, usually you'll accommodate to that. Most people, I don't know if you, you ever heard reports of heart attacks from, from cannabis. There are reports in the literature, of the, it's an interesting, the, the, um, uh, a report in a cardiac journal of an 85-year-old man that was given dronabinol, which is the synthetic THC. He had a heart attack. But they gave him 90 milligrams. So it was a single dose. I mean, that was just like crazy. And, and, uh, and, that, so, and it just so happened, it's not going to cause any problems if you have a normal coronary system. It's, this was an example of a patient, 85-year-old man, probably had critical stenosis in one of his coronary arteries. He didn't know he had it. Increased heart rate and drop in blood pressure is not a good combination if you have coronary artery disease. So palp the palpitations may be because you're increasing your heart rate. Uh, the CBD can, uh, we don't know. We don't know about CBD. And, and, and it, uh, it's probably, I mean, it does have some effect on the, on the same receptor. It, it, it interacts with it, so it probably could, but the doses is so low. Right. Uh, it doesn't do a thing for the pain, but. <laughs> 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 the patients that you treat, they, they prescribe for, where are they getting their. their from. So it's from the, dis now most of them are home delivery. You know, it's a, that's what we usually set them up with. Most of them, like, patients don't want to go to the dispensary. And it's various home deliveries uh, that, that they have a, a number of licensed home delivery that, that and they come from the dispensaries. Um, now Dr. Sexton keeps up with this for me. She tries to ke keep track of the dispensary. Now, now the, 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 the licensed dispensaries they are supposed to be following the laws with the Bureau of Cannabis Control and, and product testing. And uh, um, so it's, 
10 years ago or 15 years ago, it was a wild, wild west. And I don't know what they were getting. It still uh, is for CBD. What? It still is the wild west for CBD. Oh, CBD is like, it's crazy. It's like, and that's another thing that's very controversial. CBD is still a scheduled one drug, meaning it's illegal. But the government is kind of like, the DEA has many more problems to deal with than to worry about the CBD. But I don't recommend to my patients that just, if they're going to use the CBD, I prefer them to stick with the dispensaries. Uh, and uh, there's just so much many CBD products out there. So the, uh, the, uh, the answer is no. Epidiolex is just for the, for the Dravets. But now there's a very interesting question about, well, what about the children? What about adolescents? What about uh, using cannabis? And there is a controversy and, and, and concerns. I don't know if you've heard of the literature saying that it affects brain development, right? Now those, that is with habitual use. That's with really adolescents that are smoking cannabis around the clock. And, and now... I find it really hard to believe that medical doses in an adolescent would have any effect on brain development. Um, and now, I don't want to use it in, in adolescents. However, I do have a few adolescents that I'm treating, and they are pretty extreme cases. One of them is with a, a gunshot wound to the head and have horrible headaches. Would, and he has the choice, well, an, an opioid or a cannabis. I'm going to choose the uh, cannabis. And, uh, and then I have some, a couple of young adolescents with a really severe complex regional pain syndrome. I have one adolescent with severe fibromyalgia. Uh, but they're using very, very small doses, and it's not like it's around the clock. Um, yeah. Right now, I have an 8 to 1, 8 uh, CBD, 1 THC, drops under the tongue. Yeah. And Sometimes I get an effect, sometimes I, I don't. Is that a moderate ratio, eight to one? So, yeah, yeah. And the, the thing is that you, you, sometimes you don't and sometimes you do. Uh, that's the, that's the, the, the GI absorption is very erratic. The way you can, probably, you can get more of a predictable absorption is to co-administer with some fat, like a peanut butter or, uh, yeah. It's because whenever you co-administer it and swallow it without. The problem is, is if you, you're constantly dosing with a fatty meal, you don't want to gain weight from all the fat intake. But you can, get in, you can increase the absorption. And, and some patients will actually take a little bit of a spoon of peanut butter and drop the oil in the peanut butter and eat that because it's the fat of the peanut butter increases the absorption. What would four to one ratio do? What? If, if I went four to one, what would that do to me mentally? Four to one? Yeah. It's just going to be more THC. So the, 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 the lower the ratio, the, in, the higher the, the, the content of THC, and, and it's just about titration. There's some patients I have that do a 30 to one, and that, they don't want to go above that. They, they go from a 30 to 21, they say, whoa, it's too much. I have other patients that do a one to one constantly. Um, and it really is a matter of, of trying to find uh, that Understand, we're all different in how we absorb it from the gut. What's the frequency? Like, the only time I do it is in the morning when I get up. Mm -hmm. um, most, it varies from one time a day to four or five times a day. It, it's just really uh, an understanding that the more you use it, the more cost, it's going to cost you. <laughs> and it's because uh, it gets kind of expensive. That's, I don't know what, how, what you're paying, but my, my patients to tell me they're averaging around $80 a month is what the, the, the cost is for their, to treat their pain. Yeah. So. Another thing is the cost actually went up when the recreational, when we legalized it for recreational yeah. use. It doubled. The cost doubled because the demand went up and then the taxes kicked in. And so, yeah. So uh, well, I'm a little confused. Are, are you the only one that we could go to that would be like legitimate? to get the CBD or the C CBD? So I'm the only one that? Well, that legitimately can dispense CBD and THC. So I don't dispense it. Yeah, so, so another thing is that it's actually against the law to prescribe it. And there's a difference between authorizing and prescribing. Now, 
we're, we're sort of crossing the line. I think that we're kind of crossing the line that I'm act, we're actually prescribing because we're saying this is, what you, this is the dose you take. This is how much you take. So it's kind of controversial. Am I crossing the line? And the DEA could come knock on my door and say, Dr. Wallace, we're, re we're going to arrest you. You're prescribing it. But um, it's... So, I, so what we do, now, I'm the only one in San Diego County that probably understands how to dose it, and that's a major problem in our, med, our health, healthcare system. Most people, I think there's a lot of healthcare professionals that are very interested in using it, but they say, I don't know how to dose it. I don't, what, am I, what do I do? And, uh, and that's something that hopefully we can put together in the future, is just trying to do some training modules to try to train our healthcare professionals on how to dose it? So once you do, do you suggest the authorizes. It authorizes. <laughs> but does, does the patient go to the dispensary or to or where they get mail to the house? I think you said. Oh, yeah, okay. So, so the question was what? To the house, right? Through where? From where, though, yeah. Where does the patient come from? So where do you get it? So like, it would, so it, I, you to for me to go to just like a dispensary yeah. that is open, you know, like, um, you know. So the problem with. Boulevard. I mean, would that, that wouldn't be a good idea. You know, well, it's. Mm -hmm. The problem with the dispensaries is that when you walk into the dispensaries, yeah, you can ask them, hey, I have pain. They're not, they don't know how to do it. I mean, what I'm finding is that they, I've, I even have. Patients coming back to me and says, "Oh, yeah, that that uh, bud tender said that I should be vaping the the the, the vape pens," <laughs> and and I said, oh, "No, we don't want you to vape." But this is what they're doing. They're just saying, "Oh no, do the vape pens. That's better for you. You're gonna or or use this dose because you have pain. I think you need more of the THC." And it's just it's it's just crazy. So you're not gonna get a lot of help from those dispensary workers. Right. Um, to sign up with you? Well, you can't. You have to have a referral. I mean, I, I can't. I, we, I only see patients from a, re, a referral from their primary care doctor. So that's, uh, so I don't, we don't have a direct, so, so we, we're just way, way too busy. I can't open the door and have a bunch of patients. Hey, I want to do it. So we have to, I want them to work through their primary care doctors because I want their primary care doctor to know. Because the reason is, is because there are some drugs that the CBD interacts, interacts with. It can actually change the drug metabolism. And so your, your primary care doctor needs to know. I mean, if you're on anticoagulant or maybe you're on a, a seizure medicine, it can change the blood levels of those medicines. So I want the primary care doctor to okay and, and, and know that the, that the patient's using it. How can you use, uh, how can you use it to taper benzodiazepines? <clears throat> So pretty much the same way that you're, you do as the opioid. And, and um, benzos can be really hard to come off of, um, probably harder than, a, than an opioid. Um, but you have to do the same way, a very slow taper. I don't know if I, an example would be somebody that would be on maybe five milligrams of Valium four times a day, as an example. I would tell them to drop a half a tablet a week. So if you're taking four tablets a week, then take three and a half for a week, and then three, and then See how far you can go down until you start feeling, I don't know, it depends on what you're taking it for. Some patients take benzos at night, some patients are taking it around the clock, and then you introduce the cannabis, mm -hmm. and, then, and, then, and then continue the taper. How do you increase the cannabis? Just, the cannabis. It's the, the, the cannabis. cannabis. It's the, through the, my, my uh, naturopath. So my naturopath will sit down with them and say, this is the product we want you to use, this is how you dose it, um, and then you follow the instructions Like they're not in San Diego. Like what if the person's not in San Diego? Yeah, well, it's Can they do that by like their doctor calling the naturopath and So it's been, we do have patients come in from outside. I mean, I have patients coming in from all over the state sometimes that fly in and as a uh, it's it's kind of hard. We don't have like I don't have like a cannabis clinic. It's integrated into my practice. And so it's uh I mean, I've, we've talked about it. We've talked about having actually a medical cannabis clinic that the naturopath can come in and be at. Because right now, the naturopath that I have, she's affiliated with, in, with the research side of things, but the medical practice is still separate. They see me, and she has to see them outside. 
And, they, and another thing, and none of this is covered by your insurance. You're going to have to pay for the natural path dosing consultation. You're going to have to pay for the cannabis. Um, and then we, we're, we're trying to integrate it, but there's so many regulations. I mean, we're a federally funded institution. Yeah. And then the, the leadership is, whoa, well, okay, I don't know if we want to do it. But they're very, UC San Diego leadership is incredibly supportive mm -hmm. of this, uh, this whole medical cannabis. They just have to be careful with some of the, the, the regulations. Yeah. How do you find somebody who is qualified to give you guidance as to how much THC and CBD you should take? I mean, I've already got a letter from my doctor saying that... I'm sorry, I'm not following your question. Well, I want... How do you find somebody that will give you guidance as to how much THC and CBD you should take? Or is it just all trial and error? Are there doctors out there? Is there a list of doctors that you can go to? Well, that's, it's, the only thing I could, just what I was saying is that we, if a patient sees me, I, make, I just make sure that they're appropriate. Yeah. And then I don't give, do the dosing. Right. I send them to Dr. Sexton. Okay. She does the dosing. She guides them on dosing. And then they follow up with me. And then once she gets them set up on the dosing, I can tweak it when they come back. But there's not a lot of good, there, now there are people, there are some nurse practitioners around that are, that are getting into this dosing. Uh, there's some other naturopaths that I know. But now the naturopaths, you understand you, you can't, only a medical doctor can give the authorization for medical cannabis in the state of California. So Dr. Sexton can't see somebody, they can't, somebody can't just go to her and say, can you help me with dosing? It's against the law. She said, you have to see a doctor first. So I give the authorization, and we fax the authorization to her office. So she's doing the dosing under my, li under my authorization and license. My, our, our doctor, of course, refused and stuff. My daughter was, went to a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist, I, I thought prescription authorization, I don't know what the difference is. But she got, whatever she got, she's able to get it. But it was from a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if they, you know, were able to tell her about dosing or... Probably not. <laughs> The, but maybe, I don't know, there, there's a, the, the, um, it, that, the number one uh, reason patients are using cannabis is for pain. Mm -hmm. the, number well, two, the number two is, is depression, though. Yeah. Uh, well, she, well, she was kind of both, but it, yeah. it, well, she was able to get off all of her medications besides that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. so the, uh, uh, I know that psychiatrists are using it more. There was a lot of controversy because of the issues of of psychosis, that you with, but that's with higher doses. Um, I'm seeing psychiatrists that are using it more and more to, to treat depression and anxiety. In cervical dystonia, what do you recommend? I mean, have there been any studies specifically for this? No, there hasn't been. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just, it's, it, again, the doses are going to be very the same as if you're treating pain. Uh, it's a matter of you take too much of that THC, you're, you're going to, I don't know if your dystonia would worsen, but you definitely would be agitated and paranoid and, and you're not going to like it. Um, but I don't know. We, there's no studies in dystonia. There is studies in multiple sclerosis spasticity, though. Yeah. And they've shown that, that it does reduce the spasticity of multiple sclerosis. And there, it makes sense because there's, been a lot of reports of the THC effects on spasms, and it is an antispasmodic, uh, has antispasmodic effect. Well, the story with Charlotte's Web, and you know, I read that story. Yes, that's the Dravet's, that's the Dravet's syndrome story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the Charlotte Web, everybody understand, Google Charlotte's Web. That was a four-year-old girl with Dravet's syndrome. She's, she's like 18 years old now, I think, but she's, her, she, uh, uh, they pretty much, she was having over a, um, uh, 100 seizures a day, and they put her in hospice. They, 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 there's nothing else they can do for her, and their parents wouldn't give up. And it, interesting, her mother actually just started researching and came across these animal studies with CBD, with high doses of CBD. Mm -hmm. And she thought, well, this, what about this? And, but she was in Florida, and it was against the law, and then she got the Stanley brothers in Colorado, who was, uh, at the time, they were had an extraction 
and they extracted the CBD for her, and then she went from 100 seizures a day to maybe 14 a week, and she went on to live a normal life. That was CBD. That was CBD. And then that's what opened the door for the FDA did a compassionate use uh, uh, studies in Dravet's and intractable seizures. And then that's what led to the FDA approval. Have you seen any um, medical studies on the effect of um, CBD or THC on uh, PSA as a means of slowing down advancement of prostate cancer in men? Uh, no. And I think that there's, there's all this controversy in using cannabis and cancer. There is the, uh, there was a, um, I can't remember the name, the, the Committee on Engineering Therapeutics and Medical Technology. It was a committee that did a very broad, uh, 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 in-depth research of what's out there for cannabis with relating to pain, treatment, cancer, um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, psychiatric disorders, uh, adolescence, pre, uh, pregnancy, fe fetal uh, development. And uh, the section on cancer, they concluded there's really no evidence that it reduces cancer. It does, and now there is, where this came about though is that there was an Italian study and they, they uh, took pure THC with uh, patients with glioblastoma. It's a really bad brain cancer. And they actually infused the THC directly into the tumor and whoosh, just shrunk. It shrunk down. And that's kind of where the interest came in with, with cancer treatment. When you use the term no evidence, do you mean it's never been studied or there's studies that say that it doesn't work? So there's, there's no studies. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're trying to, there, there have been some epidemiological studies. I mean, I think the closest we have, there was um, a, a, a kind of epidemiological study of looking at habitual cannabis users and lung cancer. And they concluded that there was no increased risk of cancer in habitual use in lung cancer. But did it, um, so that was a prevention. But there's no, the only study, that, uh, the only thing in the literature I know of is that glioblastoma study, but they were using it directly into the tumor. I was using liquid oil, CBD oil under my tongue for pain, and I think I'm allergic to it. It got so raw, I couldn't use it even after a week. Yeah, you know, some patients report that. It says something that you're allergic to. What? Is there another way of using it? Um, well, there, there is edibles. Just use edibles. Um, well, it's not as controlled. So, you know, you, the, the, what you're putting under your tongue is probably no different than an edible. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think that this, this is, uh, yeah, the patients kind of like it. I tell the patients that you probably aren't getting much of absorption from under the tongue. You're, you're letting it sit there and then, and then it's salivating in your, what do you do? You swallow it. Right. You're getting most of your absorption through swallowing. So I would just, just go to a pure edible. They have they have these little edibles, like these, uh, these the, the, the edibles are usually in something a little fatty, like chocolate. Yeah, and, uh, and, and they're very easy to titrate because you can cut them. And What's the normal, how do I explain this? The, the drops in the top, how many is a normal dose? It varies. So the, and, and the dropper, and another thing is I recommend, uh, Dr. Sexton tries to, she knows the, the products to have a dropper that has markings so you can actually look and, and, and you can actually tell, yeah, I'm getting 0.1 ml or point. Don't, don't go by the drops. We t prefer to go by the actual volume. And so, because the drops are very, you don't know, I mean, it's, so basically you just put it in the, the dropper and measure it out. Okay, I'm going to start with 0.2 ml and then squirt it under your tongue and then swallow it. So going forward, we've never had THC, CBD, none of it, but are on a low dose opioid um, and just seek an improved quality of life would be to go through your program, through our primary, 
So I think the question for... For the potential use of this. So you have to be referred by your primary. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you have to be referred. Because something i got to understand, we, we have patients, like I have a lot of patients coming to me that are on an opioid. And uh, so if, I, if they're outside of the UCSD system, it's, I can't open this door. So they come into and we see everybody from all over the county. But if, if they don't have a UCSD primary, I say your primary doctor, or whoever's prescribing that opioid, has to be the one to do the taper. And, and, and they have to be the ones to, to provide the authorization. I mean, I can give them the authorization. Some, some doctors on the outside, they're sending them directly to me and say, I want you to help me with this taper and get them started on cannabis. I'm fine with it. And in that case, I'll do the authorization and get him to Sexton. Some of them come to me and say, oh, I don't want my doctor to know. And I said, I can't help you then because I, uh, now if they're within UCSD system, I can take over all of the meds. And because I know my primary care doctor is gonna, once I get them on a, on a dosing regimen, they're gonna take them over. Yeah. So if they were on a different program, they can actually still refer them to you if they're not with UCSD? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think we see, we see patients from all over. All over, and it, now, now again, it has to do with insurance too, because there are some I insurances that aren't going to—they're not in our system, or then and then you have to pay out a network, or, or you know, there are insurance issues. So. Yeah. Yeah. What what have you found uh, in your experience with CBD, taking it for pain and pregnancy? So that's—I don't recommend using these cannabinoids in pregnancy. Uh, we just don't know the effects on the fetal, uh, so I don't r recommend it. I just we tell the I mean, and I understand we don't we we don't recommend pregnant women take anything. <laughs> we don't want them to take any drugs and exposed to any drugs. Um, now the and I also understand that that the cannabinoids are what's called fat soluble. They're lipid soluble. They're very they they dissolve very well in fat. Those have a very high penetration across the placental barrier. So the higher the, the fat solubility of a drug is, the more it's going to penetrate and reach the fetus, as opposed to something that has what we call low fat solubility. That doesn't have much penetration across. So, um, so that's another thing that worries me. THC is really extremely fat soluble. And it's going to get to the fetus. I'm talking about someone who has chronic migraine. Almost every day, and uh, CBD is about the only thing that really helps. It, in addition to triptan, but other than that, the no. CBD is the only thing. Yeah, that and, 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 and then you have to you have to weigh the benefits risk. And I'm not saying it's we we recommend against it, but there are extremes, and um, and and there there are extremes that we've done things to pregnant women that gosh I I get nervous. I mean. I've taken pregnant women with pretty high dose opioids in my career, at one point in my career, and I, I don't like it, but uh, sometimes there's no alternative. And but you got to understand, we don't know um, the risk to the fetus. I have a question. These the balms that you might put on your hands, do you have any of those? Go in and affect you. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's very, the, the problem is that they, they do, I do have patients say they work for them. Uh, pain, but do they, have any other they don't have much of an effect. They don't get into the system too okay. much. Um, they probably, it's, the, the problem with the, the, the topicals, it can get kind of expensive uh, because they, uh, they extract it and then they put it into creams and it, it just gets so expensive that that usually prohibits. But I do have some patients that use it. Right? Do you foresee any trials coming up for people like dystonia or dysphonia? Something where, you know... The only, the only trial that I know of that uh, in the Department of Neurology is for restless leg syndrome. Mm. And there's a study with pure CBD. And, and, and interesting. It's a, um, it's a, there's some... And he, Dr. Um, Nahib, I think it's a neurologist. Um, that's an interesting study. They... Um, uh, couldn't find the right CBD here in the U.S., and the DEA is being, becoming more open to allow us to go across lines into Canada. And so they got the product from Canada, Canada, uh, and, and they're uh, starting a trial. I don't know anything on dystonia, 
we're going to be starting a study here really soon for a migraine abort. We got a, we got a grant, a foundation grant. Um, and that's going to be, uh, that will be inhaled, uh, for, uh, vaporized uh, for patients with acute migraine. Yeah. Um, okay, so I see CBD oil all over the place, you know, every store. So how do you know which one is really good or none of them? That's what I say. It's a wild, wild west. And, 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 and I, 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 don't, I don't recommend patients bother with that stuff that's in the health food stores. And uh, uh, the only way you're really going to know if you're getting, you know, the real CBD is to go into the dispensaries. Because mm -hmm. they are... They're, they're coming from, from some pretty, pretty good, good ma manufacturers. That, uh, and, and they're tested. Yeah. So the FDA, you know, the, this is the whole thing with these health food stores and the CBD products all over the place. The FDA has made a statement that they, 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 are, 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 they may crack down on it. They may say, okay, this is enough, and they're going to stop allowing it. Um, so the licensing dispensaries, how do you... I mean, do they display their license like? It should, yeah. You can go. You can go on the Department of Public Health website, oh. and find out which ones. You should be able to find out which ones are licensed. Oh. But, but that's another thing is that there are still some unlicensed uh, facilities out there, dispensaries that they they keep popping up. Uh, no. mm -hmm. Oh, so, well, it's you. You can ask to look for it to see it, because they're. Yeah, yeah. Because at dispensaries, all of the products that they they are giving out. So what they do is the they the, the, they they are manufactured in batches, and then they're they're by the, by the manufacturers, and then you go through the wholesalers, and they ship them out to the dispensary. So, but they're, by, by law, the manufacturers are the ones that have to do the testing, not the dispensaries. So the manufacturers do product testing, they do samples, um, and, uh, and, if, and they have to go through a licensed lab, licensed by the state, so the state knows that they're testing. And you can see, you can, you can ask them for the, the, the certificates of analysis for what you're getting. For that batch, you said? Hmm? For that batch. Yeah, trace it on the stock. This is just, I'm so dumb about all this stuff, but I'm going to ask this anyway. Some relatives of ours, they both ate the same quantity of a brownie that was laced with whatever that would be in it. And she spent the day all huddled in a corner, and he spent the day eating everything in the refrigerator, including the ketchup. <laughs> so I wonder if you could, for the ignorant, explain why the difference and what's going on? Everybody, everybody responds differently. It's, it's, and, yeah. and it's, it, it also has to do with absorption, too. Yeah. Because it may be that she just was a very, very high rapid absorber, and then the other one was not. It was yeah. maybe a little bit less. But the, 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 I think coming back to that dosing range that I told you about, so one and two milligram um, uh, analgesia, maybe a little bit of euphoria, four or five milligrams, a little bit of increased appetite, and, and maybe good sleep. Um, you start getting into 10 milligrams, and you get psychosis or, or paranoia. Yeah. And then you get a 20 milligram psychosis. That's so, absorbed dose you're talking about. That's absorbed, rather than yeah. An ingested yeah. dose. Okay. Well, it's, 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 if you, I mean, it is the, a dose given, but the thing is, that is an average response. Mm -hmm. so, so, so you have, you take a, uh, 100 people and give them 10 milligrams, probably uh, the majority of them are going to have psychosis. Mm -hmm. But there are going to be some that don't. And then, okay. oh, yeah. yeah. So I always thought that you weren't supposed to take something with THC because that gave you a high. But it sounds like you're saying there needs to be a ratio between that and. Right. I think that the THC is. Very rarely do, are my patients just taking pure CBD. They, 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 they say it doesn't work for them. Uh, but when we, yeah, but when we start do, working with the ratios and, and adding a little bit of THC, it's, it's all about low doses of THC, though. So if you were drug tested, let's say, for example, if you're out in the workforce, is that going to come back yep. positive for so, you? So it is. It is. Okay. And, and, and so this is another conversation we have with the patients. So, I tell them, first of all, 
I can't guarantee that you're, you're not gonna be positive drug tests and you could lose your job, no. but I have never had anybody lose their job with medical authorization. Um, we also talk about driving, and I tell them that there, there, there is a risk that if you get in a car accident and they test positive for THC, but now well, the way I, I educate them, as I say, um, if you inhale it, no driving for two hours. If you ingest it, no driving for eight hours. And uh, because the absorption is just so erratic. Um, and, then, and then I also tell them that, you know, it's all about titration. I say, don't drive when you're first titrating this stuff. So when you're first starting it and you're trying to find that right dose, then when you find the right dose and how you're going to use it, yeah, you can drive. Um, I tell you, there's more, there's more people out there driving with legal pharmaceuticals that shouldn't be driving than with cannabis, medical right. cannabis. Yeah, that's and, uh, when you first start it, you don't know how you're going to react to it, then it's sort of right. What's that? It's like with any medication, like yeah. when you yeah. first yeah. start it, you yeah. don't know if it's going to affect And that's why when I follow up the patients, I'm documenting in their medical record. First of all, I'm authorizing it. It's under medical authorization. I document that I do not see any signs of intoxication. They're ambulating. Their speech is not slurred. Their pupils are e-correct and non-pinpoint. I document that every time I see them. Now, if I see a patient and they're a little bit slurred speech, and that's, okay, whoa, wait, what's going on here? Uh, and, and we will tell them you, you can't drive, uh, or you have to stop it, or, or lower the dose, or whatever. I, I rarely see that, though. But it sounds like a big improvement over the opioids, though, right? Because you don't overdose really on that, whereas you can, you can die. You can die. There's, no, there's no known lethal dose of cannabis. Yeah? We all in this room that have this condition have something going on in our brain. We're perfectly sane, but we have something that, that is <laughs> going on are. in our brain that has nothing to do with mental. It has to do with giving us the condition yeah. we have. What, what would it take to get some type of a study for dystonia to test cannabis and the effect it may or may not have on a dystonia condition? You know, well, you have to have money. <laughs> so, you have to have funding. And it's uh, and more people have migraines, but this seems to be something. If it was studied, it was explored about what reaction it has on the brain to maybe help our symptoms or eliminate them. I don't know. So it's hard. It's it, it, it's it's um, very hard to do research with cannabis. It took us uh, this foundation grant that we got for the migraine. We got award, awarded this over a year ago. And it's taken a year to get all, all to go through all the regulations. Um, we have to go through the FDA, uh, NIH, the DEA, both federal and local, the Department of, of Health, Human Health Services, the California Research Advisory Panel. It's just, uh, it's, it's crazy. And, and it's because it's a scheduled one drug. Um, there is a bill before the Senate that uh, the, it was, it was two competing bills that they finally came together and uh, got one bill. It's going to pass the House. It passed the House. Now it's in Senate. The problem is our Senate is a little bit... Uh, Trump said that he will sign it. If, if, if it gets to his desk, he's, he will sign it, but it's got to get through Senate. What that's going to do is that's going to ease the regulations on research and to make it easier for us to do research with these, uh, the, the cannabis. So we're just waiting to see if it's going to pass through the Senate. The Senate right now has kind of shelved it because they're just, they're, they have so many things on their plate. So. What about countries such as Australia or uh, the European countries who have uh, very high standards on medical care but may not have restrictive laws? Can you get the information that people are looking for from overseas? Um, it's pretty hard to do it in pretty much any. It's, uh, <laughs> I think the, 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 the country that I think is probably the easiest is Israel, actually. Yeah. They seem to have the least. Uh, and then there's also the Netherlands. Has a, the Netherlands actually has a, 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 a medical grade system where doctors can actually prescribe it. And they prescribe a certain amount. And, and it's dispensed by a pharmacist. And it's, so it's a government controlled cultivation. And they actually send it to the pharmacies in you know, buds 
in the pharmacy that they, the doctor can write out. Say, this is um, the, the, the percent THC I want you to use. And, um, but uh, that's the, the, so the, and then the Canada, Canada uh, has a pretty good, they have a, a, a government controlled uh, di the dispensary of the, of the, of the products. I that's not I just found that. Mm -hmm. And the scheduling drug, I'm not sure what that refers to or how that is determined. The second um, part, I went up to LA last week and heard Dr. Wu, who's a neurologist, mm -hmm. and uh, my chiropractor had given me a magazine, which he happens to be the, on the board of, talking about transcranial <coughs> magnetic mm -hmm. stimulation. Mm -hmm. And what he explained is that is a stimulating force for people with depression mm -hmm. would not be good for something I have because it's being stimulated. Mm -hmm. How does the THC or the cannabis, are they stimulating or not? Depends on the dose. Dep depends on the dose. Oh, dose. Remember, the, I should say this, it has biphasic effects, and so if you, if you uh, have take too much of it, it's going to be uh, 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 psychosis and uh, paranoia, and uh, uh, whereas low dose is is sedating. So, and, um, uh, CBD is the uh, same way, sort of. CBD low doses can be stimulating, and then high doses, in the, up and around three and four hundred, you start getting the uh, anti-anxiety effects and a little bit higher sedating effects, and then even higher the anti-convulsive effects. But you get really high doses. You, you, you would not be able to afford those doses. Right. So. so she asked about the scheduling. Is there anything in the works of declassifying uh, that as a Schedule One drug, which is with heroin and so everything the, else? The, that's, a, that's the question. I don't know. I think that uh, um, <coughs> it's um, being a Schedule One, it's, it should be. The problem is, is scheduled. It, it, the, the FDA will never approve cannabis for treatments. And the reason is, is how are you going to approve something that has so many compounds in it? There's 108 different cannabinoids in the leaf, and then we have all these terpenes. Um, uh, so it's, it would be really hard for the FDA to say, okay, we're going to approve this as, as a therapeutic. It could possibly be scheduled Two, it could be go to a schedule two. Um, hmm? oh, but how can you put heroin and marijuana as one? I mean, that's the same They're different, though. They, I guess, yeah, it's just I crazy. Think, yeah. It should be, it's, 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 to put it as a, as a, in the same category as heroin, heroin is, is just a, crazy. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's yeah. what I can't get. Uh. Um, so let's say that we get a referral from our doctor to you, we come to you, then. Um, you go through everything, and you refer us for the dose, the part of it. And then where do we go from there to get it? Do you recommend where we go to get it? Or so Dr. Sexton would do that for you. Yeah. Dr. Sexton will actually tell you what product to use. She, she, she would set you up with the uh, uh, home delivery. That would be oh, convenient. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and, then, and then basically she just gives you a sheet and saying, this is the home delivery. She can't contact them, but yeah, you can. No, no. But, but she, she gives you the sheet and say, this is what you should order from the home delivery. Mm -hmm. And this is how you should take it. And, and she gets, awesome. yeah. And she also does more than just, just the dosing. She also educates the patients, okay, what if you do get too much? Right. What if you get too much TAC? Then she instructs you on how to get through that. And, uh, and just all these little, little uh, educational Tips. Yeah. Does she do presentations? Do you think? <laughs> do you think, does she do presentations? Because she does. She's, she's a naturopath. Uh, she does. She she has a very good a very good good presentation. She's going to be on yeah. that list. Yeah. 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 I'm assuming she does a lot of things besides yeah. just this. If she's a naturopath. Right? Oh yeah. Okay. Well, that's another thing that she does. In addition to the uh, cannabis uh, dosing, a lot of times these patients do have questions on naturopathic remedies, and she also does that. Uh, Michelle. Michelle, okay. Yeah. And what's her, how do you, is, is it S E S T O N? T O N, yeah. Mm -hmm. And she, she is, does she have a name? She's an ND. ND. Okay. 
yeah, naturopathic, doctor of naturopathic. Yeah. Yeah? One strain of cannabis, or do you use various different ones? Because I know they're one. It's varies. So there are, the strains will have different, the, the, the strains are really based on different ratios of, so there, 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 there's high CBD strains, and then there's very high THC strains. And then, and then sometimes patients will actually take a high CBD and a high THC and then mix it themselves yeah. and to come up with their, because some of them just find that, that ratio. Um, like people who want to sleep. Yeah, yeah, and it's just, it depends. Um, just to follow up on um, if you're, if you're not that familiar with this job, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> How would you uh, prescribe that then for, for I mean? So, the, you know, the, the thing is, I don't know if, let me, let me back up. I would not see patients for dystonia. I'm only seeing patients for pain. And so for patients, I, want, I just want to make, make you understand, I would not see, take a referral for dystonia. Okay. I, I, I'm only going to be pain. Now, there are some patients with dystonia that have pain too. We, we do see. We do see patients, yeah. So we do see now if, because I have, I've had patients that, that have contacted us like with Parkinson's. Can you see me to, to, as a consult for Parkinson's? I says, no, that's not in my area. You need to go through your neurologist. Um, but we do, we see a fair number of cervical dystonia patients because they, 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 we do Botox injections in them. And um, because we do a lot of Botox and, um, but the cervical dystonia, we, I, I do see a number of them. But all of them have pain. They have pain associated with it, yeah. And so we just treat them as we would be treating a pain. It's no different than a pain patient. Yeah. When, you get the, when you're talking to your primary care doctor, you don't want to say, I want to see you for cervical dystonia. Remember the way down? So it, yeah, it would be cervical dystonia, or pain, pain Pain, associ pain associated with cervical dystonia or cervical dystonia associated pain. Yeah. Hmm? Um, what, what, uh, you mentioned the monthly cost for people who are taking uh, cannabis for uh, pain control. I wrote down $80 a month, is that right? Or is it more 800 That's a ballpark. I mean, there's, uh, and it depends on, on how much you're using. Hmm? Yeah. Well, that's uh, and it's interesting because I find that some patients they, they replace medications and so their copays go down, yeah. and so it all evens out yeah. a lot of times. Yeah, so. it's all. Uh. Right.